So good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see so many colleagues and friends in three dimensions again. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this morning in person and virtually to celebrate the 2021 Presidential Award for Distinguished Service in International Education. My name is Valeria Bertacco, and I am the Vice Provost for Engaged Learning. The Presidential Award for Distinguished Service in International Education is a young award established by President Schlissel in 2017 to celebrate and recognize the extraordinary effort of our faculty and staff in advancing edu uh, inter international education for our Michigan students. You all are well aware of how critical international education is in offering a well-rounded experience to our students. Each year, our institution offers hundreds of distinct opportunities to them. And that is thanks to the work that our passionate faculty and staff dedicate to organize such a rich offering. This year's selection was extremely challenging as we received 18 spectacular nominations from which the committee could recognize only one awardee. Thus, first I would like to extend a special thank you to the selection committee for their thoughtful work in discussing and evaluating each nomination. And let me also remind all of you that next year application process will open later this fall and the announcement will be published at the president's website. This year gathering is very special and is, I think, especially meaningful to all of us who are dedicated to international education. First, today we get to meet and celebrate in person once again after a long hiatus. And I'm delighted that our awardee can experience your warmth and your energy as well in person. Today we also celebrate renewed hope for international engagement. As more and more borders are reopening, more international programs are restarting, and our students, faculty, and staff are eager to engage in international experiences after over a year of cancellations, lockdown, and restricted destinations. I know this because we can read all this pent-up pressure by just looking at the rate of submission to our international travel registry. And now, Without further ado, let me introduce the individual who needs no introduction, President Mark Schlissel. Uh, thanks very much, Valeria, for the uh, no introduction introduction. It's very kind. Uh, so, you know, this is actually fun, right? You know, we, uh, we have, uh, this is the first event uh, official event for the university uh, that I've done uh, in person with a large group, wonderful coffee and treats uh, that, uh, you know, the, you have a fondness for things that you miss um, uh, since the pandemic, since March of 2020. So, um, you know, b before uh, making uh, some more specific comments about John, uh, I want to thank everybody that's here for soldiering on and making it through this really challenging time and continuing the mission of the university, serving our students internationally, serving our students here, um, you know, supporting our faculty, our faculty who are you know, in the classrooms teaching or teaching online, which is extremely challenging until you get used to it. Uh, so just you know, a big thank you. And we're not you know, out of the pandemic yet, but we're sort of transitioning to living with the virus. Um, and events like this are part of that transition. So thanks to the event staff for putting it all together and pulling it off and to you uh, for coming masks and all uh, to the event. Uh, and you know, I hope you uh, enjoy this and you know, appreciate uh, the moment. Uh, it's really great to be back in person, particularly to extol the virtues of global higher education. Uh, events over the last year and a half have deeply changed the ways we view ourselves and the world at large. Uh, what's now clear to many has been clear to you all along. We do not and cannot operate in isolation, either as an institution or as individuals. Global engagements make our university stronger and our students smarter. When we welcome international students, send our students overseas, and collaborate around the world on research, all parts of our public mission are upheld and advanced. Today we celebrate the individual and individual who's devoted his career to lifting us up and moving us forward. Uh, Dr. John Godfrey, Assistant Dean of the Rackham Graduate School, is a pillar of Michigan's international community. 
For nearly 30 years, he's helped shape our institution. In 1993, he joined U of M and served as a founding member of the International Institute. In each of his subsequent roles, he has continued to advocate for and enrich the experiences of students both on campus and around the world. He led the creation of International Travel Oversight Committee, which recommends policies for traveling around the globe. This committee was an essential source of guidance even before the pandemic, supporting safety and well-being of our students, staff, and faculty. Dr. Godfrey has always been an incredible source of support. Following the 2016 election, he helped our international, undocumented, and documented students navigate uncertain policies and was there when they needed kindness and compassion. He moderated a forum that I remember well that gave students a chance to ask U of M leaders about immigration policies and related concerns. He advises Michigan's graduate Rackham International Group for international students. There are so many who describe him as a fierce advocate and mentor. Students have shared that whenever he meets a new uh, member of the group, he makes a point to welcome them, learn where they're from, and share his own experiences to foster deep and enduring connections. Dr. Godfrey's advocacy has come to the forefront over the 18 months, the last 18 months, to address obstacles from the pandemic. Working collaboratively, he developed a pathway for international students in doctoral programs to pursue their studies and research remotely, keeping their careers moving and providing a welcome sense of normalcy. I've relied on him as well over the years. Whenever there's a crisis, a moment where one of our students or colleagues is overseas, uh, either uh, in a, a, a local problem, a global conflict, uh, John's the go-to person. Uh, he provides sage advice, a calm influence, a wealth of experience, uh, whether it's about a global crisis zone or whether it's a discussion about whether to rescind a prize or award the university is awarded to somebody when circumstances change. Uh, also about how best to advocate for our DACA students. Um, uh, he's just a tremendous, has been a tremendous resource throughout my presidency. Uh, for many years, he's been an integral part of our university's honorary degree committee and serves as the chair of the Wallenberg Award Committee. Through this work, he's elevated and honored those who promote peace, the advancement of knowledge, and a more connected, compassionate world. Now it's time for us to honor him. He's touched the lives of countless people, truly reaching every corner of the world, while strengthening Michigan as a global force for good. Please join me in welcoming this year's recipient of the Presidential Award for Distinguished Service in International Education, Dr. John Godfrey. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So Valeria told me I had a few minutes, and I'm going to take them. Uh, if you don't mind, I ask your forbearance. Um, I want to thank all of you for, I, I'm astonished at this. I truly am, to see so many faces of people who, over the years who have helped me um, uh, do better at what I try to do on behalf of the university and its students and its faculty. Uh, I, I, I find you all inspiring. Um, I'd particularly like to uh, acknowledge David William Cohen, who is here, uh, who is on my dissertation committee at Johns Hopkins, who is a brilliant historian, and uh, who brought me to Michigan uh, in 1993 when I helped him get the International Institute off the ground. Uh, and I remember his words when I was you know, thinking about how are we possibly going to do this and you know where is the international at this university and David told me all you have to do is stand out on the street and the international walks by you so thank you president Schlissel for this award I am very grateful but it is with certain misgivings that I stand here alone today as my contributions toward international education on behalf of the university have only been possible through the extraordinary professional commitment 
sustained effort, and deep experience of many key staff throughout the university who over the years have supported our students and faculty to make Michigan a leading global university. Nothing that I have been able to contribute would have been possible without the wisdom, initiative, and dedication to creative problem solving of colleagues at the International Center, Rackham Admissions at the Center for Global and Intercultural Study, Rackham, um, the English Language Institute, and the International Safety Office, as well as at the Center for Global and Intercultural Study. It is these dedicated staff and many others who collaborate to guide the many comings and goings across this university's threshold to the world. I ask your patience for a bit of personal retrospective wandering. At 17, I was selected to spend a year living with a family in Colombia as an American Field Service student. Like a gift from the gods, I was sprung free midway through my last year in high school. My elation was tempered, however, by the pressing awareness that I did not possess a single word of Spanish. Three days later, I joined my new school after leaving home in Maine. And my new school, no one spoke more than the most rudimentary English. The school sat in a fairly ramshackle set of repurposed buildings tucked in the shadow of the Cerros Orientales at the northern edge of Bogota. Later, I realized that the headmaster and his wife intended this instituto to be free of the more regimented strictures that characterized other schools, to be more diverse in the makeup of its student body, and to be a place that recognized the unified and organic way of learning through the encouragement of discussion, dialogue, and debate among students and teachers. Although we wore daily wore a tie and uniform, mine of course was made to order because of my height, I had landed in what, in Colombian terms, was a place largely free from the rigid imperatives characteristic of most Colombian schools. But the language was all new to me. Discussion, dialogue, and debate were far from my grasp. Rather, effectively mute, I gasped to learn. This was exhausting. But how inspiring was the patient tutelage of my new companions, the care and regard they accorded me, a stranger in a strange land. Over many weeks, I slowly pieced together a certain functional capability. I realized how liberating it can be to be forced to embrace a self-aware ignorance and the freedom to interpret experience in a world that, to my eyes, was wholly dazzling. In time, I established an unsteady facility in my new language. Better able to fathom my new world, I learned that my fellow students were transfixed by a literary miracle that had happened the year before when Gabriel Garcia Marquez published his magisterial novel, 100 Years of Solitude. The conversations and debates around this new work before and after school were detailed and intense and largely beyond my ken. But I determined to give it a go and relied on my companions to help me launch an expedition into this mytho-historical narration of Colombia itself that was telescoped into, uh, into a locality where time bends to an occult purpose. The famous first sentence of this novel in English is, many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Coronel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. Now that's a lead in a great story. I mean, Marquez was a journalist and you can tell from that sentence. But often I found myself bewildered by the exacting specificity of vocabulary, disoriented by the temporalities of the narrative, and I don't recall that I actually made it to the end. What I do recall, however, is the interest my companions took in my effort, their patient eagerness to explain and interpret, and their contagious pride in the remarkable accomplishment of their countrymen, who came from a background much like theirs, and whose novel transformed and made convergent their personal and national histories. Also, to a person, and like Marquez himself, they embraced a passionate opposition to Yankee and neo-imperialism and a revolutionary solidarity with Colombia's oppressed who had been swept up in that country's longest war. At about this time, as I was slogging my way through the thick underbrush of Marquez's prose, one of my companions asked if I could explicate the following lines of a poem in English that he was trying to learn. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. 
These, of course, are the first lines of Byron's lyrical poem, She Walks in Beauty. Please be sympathetic to my situation. Struggling to recall my high school English classes and filtering through my now passingly coherent Spanish, I surely offered an insipid explanation. But his question precipitated animated discussions about the meaning of the phrase, she walks in beauty, which captured the attention of my companions and became a topic of attention for several days. I don't recall that any persuasive conclusion was reached in these discussions, but I find, found this both striking and enigmatic. Why was Byron's gallant lyric of compelling interest to these people? Not until many years later did I reflect on this. I had been struck by the reflexive courtesies of my companions that they observed when they encountered one another, how a polite greeting, handshake, and inquiries about well-being were extended to each, no matter how large the gathering, how the sharing of cigarettes had a particular etiquette, how greetings were marked with a particular, rather courtly and highly individualized accommodation for friends or new acquaintances without discrimination to gender or social standing. As an American teenager come of age in the fraught informalities of the 60s, this, to me, was like the discovery of ice. In later years, I could have better decoded the semantics of these obligatory, obligatory social exchanges and courtesies, which were the parentheses to impassioned and occasionally elusive conversations about politics, sex, death, poetry, and the fate of the Millionarios Football Club. But the experience of these accommodations and gestures enacted before me, and which were unfiltered by any insight or knowledge I was capable of providing, left an acute impression. The nuances imparted by these routines were thresholds to meanings I could only incompletely discern, but not translate. And it was only in later years I glimpsed the affinities that Marquez and my companions shared with Byron, a disturber of the social and political norms of the Enlightenment, a revolutionary hero to the Greek, in the Greek War of Independence, and for whom passion, experience, knowledge, and zeal for national self-determination had left a legacy in the imaginings of these companions in a city high in the Andes. Through this, my first experience in international education, I learned that the enigma of arriving elsewhere, of facing the unsettling limits of one's experience and knowledge, is exhilarating and liberating. I carried with me no expertise and was obligated to acquire a new language to have any access to what was before me, and the world had become new again. Guided by the expertise of my companions and others during that extraordinary year, who gave me the courtesy of sharing their knowledge, their beliefs, their aspirations, their desires, and their fears. This gift to me, immeasurable, was to allow me for a time to translate myself imperfectly into a world I could not otherwise imagine. And is this not what this very university, a twinned project of both the Enlightenment and the Romantic movement, aspires for its students? To be centered in a career path, to seek establishment of expertise in a chosen field, is the argument of the present moment. But from the privilege of a backward glance, this alone seems to me an insufficient aspiration. What I learned from my 18th year is that it is in the richness of the liminal, the uncertain, and the untranslated parts of the world, measured against our ignorance, that experience brings knowledge which we can interpret for the rest of our lives. Again, thank you for this award and for allowing me to share these reflections with you. And thank you, Valeria Bertacco, Mary Gallagher, and Omolare Adumbe in joining this morning's conversation. I am truly most grateful and very moved. Thank you. We're going to take a second to assemble our panelists. Oh, they're miking up.
Let me use the spare since I'm gonna sit down. Okay. Look at So this year we thought about having a panel discussion as part of this celebration to discuss with you how you think about many different dimensions about this university. The topic of our panel is advancing a global university in a changing world. And the global university in the title in this case is our own institution. The mission of the University of Michigan is to serve the people of the world, developing citizens and leaders. As of 2019, the University of Michigan ranked fourth nationally for number of US students traveling abroad. And this volume is only a small portion of the, other, of the, of the over 5,600 students who completed over 6,000 travel abroad during the same academic year. And the over 9,000 international visitors to the University of Michigan campuses. But today, the world is changing at a faster pace than ever and in more dimension and spaces than ever. What I hope to discuss with our distinguished panelists is precisely how can the university adapt its mission of education, research, and service in the context of these changes? How can we prepare our students to lead in a world that is experiencing increased connectivities and connection, but is also facing many new challenges, from climate change to health disparities, to social dislocations and to political crisis? Before we dive into the discussion, let me introduce our panelists very briefly. So we have Professor Mary Gallagher in the middle. She is the Amy and Alan Lowenstein Chair in Democracy, Democratization, and Human Rights in Political Science at the University of Michigan. She's also a faculty associate at the Institute for Social Research. And importantly, she is the director of the International Institute. She's an expert in Chinese politics, law and society, and labor politics. Professor Gallagher studied at Nanjing University in 89 she taught at the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing in 1997. She was a Fulbright Research Scholar at East China University of Politics and Law in Shanghai in 03 and 04, and a visiting professor at the Kowan School of Law at Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 12 and 13. And then our next panelist on the far end is Professor Omolade Adumbi, who is a political and environmental anthropologist and associate professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies and the program in the environment, both at U of M. He's a faculty associate in the Donia Human Rights Center. His research focuses on environmental politics and the relation between multinational corporations and the post-colonial state. He has been recognized by several awards within and beyond our institution, including the Amore Talbot Prize for African Anthropology by the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, which recognized his book Oil, Wealth, and Insurgency in Nigeria as the best book in anthropology of Africa. And then we have Dr. John Goffrey, Assistant Dean at the Rakwa Graduate School. He's our RD today, and you have just heard some of the highlights of his accomplishment in serving our institution over multiple decades. So let's get started. Dear panelists, I have a few questions for you, but I also hope our audience will have many more questions, both the audience we are here today in person mm -hmm and our audience online who can ask questions via chat. So my first question is, we're going to start by discussing the health aspects of international engagement. Is that probably top of mind for many of us nowadays? The recent pandemic has brought many challenges and many opportunities. What do we think is here to stay? What has contributed to lower the barriers in connecting our institution with our nations and international endeavors? How can that have a positive impact on our enterprise in the long term? In other words, how can we make lemonades from lemon? <laughs> Who would like to start? <laughs> no? I've already spoken. Is it me? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm starting? Yeah. I thought I was doing the politics one. Yeah. Oh, it's just the kickoff. Uh, <laughs> so, um... Should we wear masks? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm kicking us off. Um, I, I'm 
like Valeria said, and thank you for the introduction, I'm currently directing the International Institute. Um, I took over the directing, uh, the directorship uh, during the pandemic, so my only experience of directing something that is really geared towards international education has been during the pandemic. Um, I, w I guess my most significant um, positive change during the pandemic is, is the ability to reach larger audiences through virtual programming. I think that will be something that will stay. I think it's something that overwhelmingly is a positive. Um, I wouldn't want it to be the only way in which we do programming, and I think we're trying now to branch out to do things that are more hybrid and also that um, for students in particular can be more in person. But the fact that we can host an event on a relatively small, maybe narrow research topic and have hundreds of people participate is just amazing. And I think for me, for somebody who studies China, and it's, I'll, I'll talk later about some of the ways in which that's been very negatively affected, although not just by the pandemic, um, this is allowing us to, I think, get around, um, in some cases, but not always, get around some of the new political difficulties um, that have made travel, visas, joint research increasingly difficult, not just in China, but in other parts of the world as well. Yeah. Just to add to that, I think uh, one of the positives that uh, I can take away from uh, 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 the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is uh, the ability to host uh, uh, guests in, my, in some of the classes that I teach, particularly classes that uh, uh, focuses on uh, uh, international environmental politics. So for example, I was able to uh, have uh, some of our international partners, particularly those who had been here previously as uh, uh, one of the University of Michigan African Presidential Scholars Program to talk to my students. And that was really valuable to all of the students because they were able to see how uh, some of those scholars who are in Africa uh, are interacting with their students during the pandemic and uh, they were also able to ask uh, good questions from uh, them. So I think that was one of the positives that can be taken away from COVID-19. Uh, what I've been struck, one of the things that has struck me in the past 18 months is how the pandemic has so deeply affected the ability of doctoral students to conduct their research overseas, mm -hmm. uh, that it has um, frozen uh, the plans of students who had expected it th as doctoral candidates to conduct their research at field sites all around the world in libraries, museums, and communities. And the, um, this has forced uh, uh, faculty advisors and programs to rethink uh, uh, the, the, the research experience. Uh, and, to, it's been a, it's, and it's been a very serious struggle. Um, there is uh, no amount of, of online, uh, digital, digitally mediated interaction um, can compensate for that loss of that direct experience of research in the field, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, but we've had uh, lots and many, many dozens of experiments of uh, enterprising efforts to try and um, surmount the barrier that the pandemic has created. I think we are going to have to harvest those lessons in the coming months and to determine how this may reshape the ways in which doctoral education, international doctoral education, or doctoral, doctoral research uh, takes shape, takes place. So, um, but I, I, I think that those experiments are yet to be, again, we, to be discovered and learned. Do we have questions for the audience? One of the thoughts that come to mind when I hear this is, yes, there'll be many more virtual connections, because we have been forced to, but for many of them, we wish we could be in person. And so it's still the case that it becomes the best second choice in a sense, right? Are there activities among this big pool of things that happen virtually 
that we think we master or they're valuable to the point that they're there to stay whether we can meet in person or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the ability to have uh, international guests in our classes might be one of uh, uh, the things that uh, has, uh, has come to stay, yeah. uh, especially if you teach uh, uh, classes that need uh, uh, students to think about uh, international experience. So if uh, we are able to connect with uh, some of our international partners to speak to those students, that might be something that we want to continue to have. In my field, I also see that people are not that willing to do conferences in person anymore. <laughs> it's nice to be able to mix and socialize and discuss ideas, but the investment of time versus a virtual conference is major, and yeah. there is no hurry to transition that back. Should we move to the next topic? Climate change. <laughs> <laughs> climate change is being felt more and more strongly each year. How do extreme climate-related events and the social political impact that is a byproduct of this event affect how we engage internationally? Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, we are in the era where we are witnessing what I call the social death of the environment. And that is because uh, uh, our consumptive patterns across the world uh, uh, have put us in a situation where the environment is condemned to a form of social death. And uh, this condemnation is not just about the environment, but it's also about the people who inhabit this environment. And in most cases, when we think about climate change, we think about uh, some of the extreme weather conditions that we experience in the United States, particularly uh, the recent Ida hurricane and the one that devastated Puerto Rico, uh, I think last year or a few years ago. But at the same time, what we oftentimes don't think about or don't uh, talk about is the impact of climate change on many of the communities where our faculty and students do research here. And I'll use the example of uh, where I do my research in Nigeria. Uh, there is an insurgency in the northern part of the country, which is oftentimes tagged Islamic insurgency. And there is not, this is not just in the northern part of Nigeria, but it spreads across the West African subregion. But what I've found is that the missing part of this argument about insurgency is the consequences, devastating consequences of climate change on the environment that is pushing people towards the extreme. So for example, Lake Chad, which for many years have served as a lake that helps farmers and herders um, have some level of livelihood it's now in crisis, and a lot of people have been pushed away from there because the lake is drying up. Then that poses a lot of challenge to livelihood. But the final point I'll make about this is that this is also important to national security, whether the national security of the United States or the, national sec or the, or the security of the world, because it is leading to a lot of migra migration. And when we see migration, we think about immigrants coming to the United States or immigrants traveling to Europe to take up jobs of the people who live there. But that is not the end of the argument or the issue. But more importantly is that we need to begin to think about why are migrants living in their own spaces? No one wants to live where they are happy. Where people are living because of extreme weather conditions that are impacting their livelihood practices. Any other comment? Uh, <clears throat> I think you know the uh, the quite the two. I see climate change and the pandemic is sort and every it's been. I guess a commonplace, the sort of these twin um, crises of expertise that challenge expertise to be socially and politically effective. 
Um, and I think it poses a, um, a, a novel challenge to an institution such as this as we prepare students for careers that formulate some kind of engender some certain expertise in a specific area. Um, is uh, to what end can this expertise be effective and impactful? Um, if there are no political or institutional means to, for that expertise to become meaningful in the daily lives of, of people. Um, I think this is, I don't have an answer to this, but I think it, it poses a, um, for us, a kind of an existential question uh, for, the, for the university, for any university, about uh, the efficacy of, of what we assume that we do as an institution, as our mission, take our mission to be, um, and the limits to which our intellectual, our academic preparation of our students um, can be brought to bear on these most grave global problems of this kind. Um, I, you know, I think this has been demonstrated in many areas, most recently certainly in this in Afghanistan, in this failed attempt over 20 years to produce change within communities and cultures which are so totally different, which operates in remarkably different principles from those that we assume that they had. Um, so I think this is, a, this is we're in a moment of, uh, of warning for all of us and a moment of introspection for the purpose of the university. And, our assumptions. So I'll leave that baleful comment right there. <laughs> I would add that in addition of offering education in this space, being able to have our students see situations where people live in area because of the impact of climate change, I think would be a great motivator to create the demand for that type of uh, specialized areas of education. I was really struck this summer um, <clears throat> by uh, two images and then the similarities. One was the floods earlier in the summer in Zhengzhou in Hunan um, mm -hmm. and the flooding of the subways and then more recently in New York City where I had just dropped off my daughter in, in, for college, the subways um, in New York City also flooding as they did during Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I was struck in particular by the, by the fact that in both countries which um, our two main contributors to climate change, a sense of um, imperviousness. Um, the Zhengzhou subways are very new. The, the, the city is being built up in a way to mitigate the effects of climate change. And I think up until recently, New Yorkers probably, although their subways are very old, um, felt that um, most you know, rich industrialized cities are, are you know, mm. not going to be, and particularly in, in the part of, that part of the Northeast, not going to be affected. And what we can do to um, at least explain the lack of um, recognition of the severity of the problem as political, you know, being a political scientist trying to explain why there doesn't seem to be the proper recognition of the problem. Um, and, and it's, it's something that I think, again, what we can do in international education um, and in U.S.-China relations currently, it's really the, the, the gl glimmer of hope for cooperation is around climate change. So we'll see. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, political threats and events are having an increasing impact on our international collaborations. And as you mentioned earlier, even on travel and visas, especially in certain geographical and discipline areas. And I'm not even going to mention, but we all know which countries are the most affected by this. How can we address these challenges so have to have a clear framework to determine what engagement can and should still be pursued? And you just mentioned one, even if the boundaries are still gray around that framework. And how can we continue to push forward with activities that should not be impacted by this type of challenge? And they're still way above board. 
So this is, um, this is a question that I've been thinking a lot about um, in regards to China. And I, I realize that, of course, other parts of the world are also affected. Um, although I think China is really the focus, partly because our educational collaborations with China were by far the most developed. Yep. Um, and you know what's the most interesting thing to me about it, and I'd love to hear from people like you, Valeria, in, in STEM fields, you know, for, for people like me in the social sciences or even in some parts of the humanities, up until recently, it, it was difficult to collaborate um, because the topics that we were doing were sensitive. I mean, the politics was sensitive, access to field work is sensitive, um, data can be a state secret. All, and so STEM was this area where collaboration was not only safe, but actually encouraged um, by both governments. And we've seen this complete turnaround um, in, in recent years. The pandemic, I think, has exacerbated it um, for sure. So um, that to me is a really striking thing. Not that social science or humanities research is easier either. They've both become more difficult. But the change in STEM is, is really um, drastic. And um, it's what US-China educational collaboration since the 1970s was, was built on. In terms of what we can do, I just want to say two things. Um, one is, no matter what, you can, make an, you can make an argument based on national security that we should not stop educational collaboration because we need to continue to have competency in foreign languages, in, 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 in culture, in understanding the politics of places around the world. So you can still make a, a, a very straightforward argument to national governments that we should not cut ties. The, the cutting ties is not to our advantage. Um, <clears throat> that's a kind of argument that, that maybe is, is something that the US government would be open to hearing. The other side of it is, um, from our perspective as scholars, as students, as researchers, um, we have a lot of common ground. Um, we continue to have a lot of common ground with our, with our colleagues around the world. Um, and no matter what happens at the bilateral level between this government and other governments around the world, we should always be seeking to find places to collaborate with our, with our colleagues. Um, although increasingly, I think the concern for people like me who work in China is that this is not just a problem of the US government. The things that are happening in China are also um, really severe for people there, and that we really have, we really have a lot of common um, concerns about our own governments that we should continue to sort of have dialogue uh, and not to see, to try to separate ourselves as much as we can from this kind of breakdown in bilateral relations. And I guess I can add that as educators and researchers, the more our collaboration are global, the better the ideas, the solution that emerge. You know, separating a portion of the planet is definitely not going to be beneficial under any condition. Yeah. Um, so I think we touch on very on three very hot topics, right? And and all topics that are making. Um, our mission of working globally and, and, and providing opportunity for international and global experience to our students is challenged. So the most difficult question is this, how can we actually further expand and further grow our international engagement, even in light of all of this, so that our students graduate from whatever degrees they're pursuing as better prepared to endeavor in a career in a world that is always more connected and more multicultural. And they can fit in that and they can, labor, can collaborate across disciplines and, and cultures. <laughs> and I'm looking even for concrete ideas that I'm gonna go off and try to pursue. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, so, you know, the world is, um, divided in new ways, isn't it? It's, um, and it's dividing itself in new ways um, that are, um, that will 
I think ultimately, being optimistic about this, provide their own resolution, their own solutions, their own workarounds. People and ideas seep across borders. That's always been the case. Um, even during the Second World War, this university continued to receive get students who came from China because they figured out how to leave China through the South, through Southeast Asia, and get passage, safe passage on ships through the remote, the furthest southern Pacific oceans, and are to be able to arrive here uh, in order to study. Um, during the Cold War, during the worst parts of the Cold War in the 1950s, this is apropos of STEM, uh, our physics faculty who worked in the fairly abstruse area of the spin of electrons and the theory around this, continued to collaborate with colleagues in Russia. And they worked through fairly covert channels that were enabled by our US State Department. Um, the, the, will to, to, the will to knowledge, the ambitions that motivate our best scholars, our, the best students, the ambitions that have guided them from the time they were young, will bring them across our bring them across borders, and in both directions. I'm also thinking of our students who have ambitions, much like I did when I was much younger, to go out and to set forth into the world. Um, international education will find its way. In this ballroom in a October evening in 1934, Raoul Wallenberg, who is, was an international student and probably our best known alumnus, attended the Architects Ball a few weeks before he set out on his life's journey. I'm very optimistic that this university will continue to be part of the world in its totality. And that whatever barriers that may seem insurmountable at the moment will, with time, be surmounted and circumnavigated. Because it's always been the circumnavigation that individuals construct that have brought people to places of learning such as this. Um, so I, I'm, I don't have specific solutions, but I have undeterred optimism that we will continue to be one of the world's truly leading global universities. Thank you, John. <laughs> Instead of action item, you give me inspiration. <laughs> I think. A question over there. Oh, yeah. please go ahead. I totally understand, uh, you know, how you're uh, accentuating the, the positive, but we also have domestically a lot of uh, kickback. I mean, pushback. Let's say, because of populism, uh, self-centeredness, uh, and of course. Yes, there is international education, but because of our immigration uh, problems, uh, many people are now going to Canada, to Australia, mm -hmm. to Great Britain, Europe, instead of coming here. And I think uh, because of that, we have to also focus not on uh, top-down solutions, uh, looking at power and structures in terms of politics, but rather bottom-up, uh, getting uh, in touch with communities rather than with uh, political institutions, I would say. And uh, think about at least, uh, you know, post-coloniality, decolonizing things. And I think that requires a new approach that does not go through institutions, but rather through community formation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, have a, I was thinking about something related to this, and it struck me too in John's remarks about his experience in Colombia. 
which is that if he had had a cell phone, he would not have had those experiences <laughs> to the same extent because he would have been, you know, you could stay, you can stay more connected um, because of technology in a way that can also generate more isolation. Um, and I think that's something to think about, particularly as, as, as we return to resident education as um, people from abroad can, can come back into the United States, even though we, I, I totally agree these problems of immigration and visa restrictions and, um, are really, really severe in this country and they're to our detriment for sure. But um, to do more to um, um, encourage um, students in particular, I think, who come in and can, and can, can, can continue to be in what I would call kind of a social media bubble um, that doesn't allow for the same kind of experience that I had as a, as a student traveling for the first time in China in the 1980s or that John had. Um, my daughter went to Taiwan right before the pandemic and she was lost and she called me <laughs> to, to help her navigate Taipei and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, I'm happy to help you, but you should probably ask somebody on the street. Um, <laughs> but the fact that she could call me and ask for help just kind of blew my mind. It's such a different, and it's not all to the better. Yeah. <clears throat> just uh, uh, to uh, re-echo what uh, Fatima said uh, earlier on about uh, bottom-up bottom -up, uh, approach. And uh, I want to connect that to the point uh, John made about uh, Raoul Wallenberg earlier on. And I think that is one of the ways in which we can actually strengthen our international engagement by investing in uh, more programs that uh, not only take uh, uh, our students to all these international spaces, but at the same time, exchange program that can bring uh, students particularly undergraduate students uh, uh, to the University of Michigan. And there is one currently that uh, the African Studies Center in partnership with the university in Ethiopia uh, does, I mean, uh, co sorry, College of Engineering, uh, in partnership with uh, 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 an institute, a technology institute in Ethiopia does, where students uh, from this institute comes to Michigan to spend uh, a semester. So, if we can replicate that in many uh, universities around the world, it might become an opportunity for a lot of students to come here, not necessarily as University of Michigan students, but uh, students that can come and have the Michigan experience and uh, the Michigan difference can make a lot of impact in many of uh, these places around the world. Then the final point I'll make is that uh, uh, you know, being a global leader in education, we can unleash uh, the ingenuity of our faculty and students onto the world. For example, uh, solar is something that is uh, gaining ground as uh, uh, a renewable energy uh, in many uh, parts of the world, particularly African countries where sunshine in some places can be as long as uh, for 15 to 18 hours. But solar technology started in the United States, but today China seems to be the leader mm -hmm. in producing this technology. But even at that, there are a lot of communities with, with no access to electricity. So we can lead in this area by you know, getting our students to think through some of the uh, practices that can help unleash this onto the world. Thank you. Okay. I think we are over time. <laughs> so thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. And I hope to see you all next year in person. <laughs>